All right. Let's play with with uh, Jai again. Uh, I'm gonna share the Google Meet. Uh, anyone wants to join up audio? So last time we left off at um, having built this Minesweeper program and let's try to run it actually again because I got a new compiler, uh, the new version, the new beta. Um, and so we want to make sure that, it's, that this still runs. Uh, so what did we do? In the Jai. And then I think I called it main. Yeah, oh, main.jai. Okay. Oh no. Oh, I think I remember this. I made some changes to a library file, and of course that got overwritten. Well, that's okay. We can comment out some of the GL stuff. So let's have a quick look. Where was this again? Uh, GL matrix mode. Oh yeah, I remember. We had to, uh, we commented out uh, something here at the top, I believe, where we switched out this for that. Let's see if with that modification it works again. Oh uh, yeah, I do remember some of this. Well, I don't want to go debug this again. That's okay, I'm just going to comment out that stuff. All the GL stuff. But at least uh, this should still work and we have a board. And I guess we don't care about this either. And we can just print, uh, print the board. And then we should be basically back to where we were. We do this, then we still need to print this, and I guess we have to actually take care to uh, to free this, right? So this is like the, the board string, and then at the end we have to free. It doesn't really matter because the program terminates anyway. But let's try this again. Okay. Uh, it's complaining about that. It's okay. Uh, and then we do main dot executable. Oh yeah, we got a really big board. Okay, so that seems to that seems to still work. Great. So what I wanted to do today was to um, learn a little bit about the intro the introspection uh, functionality of Jai, where you can um, basically get an AST, an abstract syntax tree from the compiler itself. And then we should be able to make modifications to that abstract syntax tree. And maybe we can use that to get a very, very basic formatter. So that if we do something like this, it will automatically format it to something like this. That would be, that would be pretty neat. So let's see if we, um, I know that there's a couple of examples and I think some of them uh, use maybe some of the introspection capabilities. Um, well, there's, okay, so I know that there's type info. That's not quite what we need, uh, but I just don't quite remember where this stuff is. Oh, program print. Okay, so program print does a very basic version of this. Uh, but I don't know if it's being used anywhere in any examples. Uh, let's do case sensitive search. Okay, so it's not being imported anywhere. Um, and there's not really much information. Okay, so this might not be best place to start. Uh, 
Okay, let's search for one of these things though. Code declaration. Um, okay, so I guess the chess example does some does some stuff where it uses this code declaration part of the AST. We have a um, thing that looks like it might be some uh, instrumentation, maybe for performance measurement. Um, this is something that checks some code. Okay, so we have a fair number of examples. Um, oh yeah, I think these are the actual definitions. We will definitely be needing those. So this is these are sort of all the types that we can that we can get. Um, so let's keep that and let's maybe close all the other tabs. Ah, uh, sometimes text hangs. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Okay, let's go through this again. That's the compiler. Okay, and then there's another thing. Okay, so maybe our best bet is to just look at this first example, this uh, chess thing, and try to figure out how this is being used. So I guess here we have a special compiler directive that says run build. And so this should be uh, getting um, run at, at compile time. So when we actually run the compiler. And so here, yeah, I think this is the stuff where we... Um, Sort of like take over the compilation. John has a couple of um, couple of videos about how this works exactly, but I don't want to go watch those videos now. That would take a lot of time. Um, okay, so there's a lot of stuff happening here. All sorts of arguments. Oh uh, yeah, I think that because this is an example where we where they kind of combine uh, J and C code or C plus plus yeah C code. So there's all sorts of stuff here for that. Might be a little bit, mm, a little bit more than we're bargaining for. Uh, let's maybe look at the compiler. I believe that there's some, some uh, function that we can call. Okay, so these are all type definitions. Um, okay, so here are a couple of. Aha, yeah, I think this compiler begin intercept is uh, what I was thinking about. Uh, so that might be that might be interesting to look at. Let's see what this is being used. Okay, so there's actually a couple of um, a couple of examples. Icon test. Let's see. Okay, this looks like like a very simple uh, simple program. So let's maybe start with something like this. Okay, I think this is an example where they set an icon to an executable. Okay, great. We don't care too much about that, um, but I guess we can do something similar. So let's start a let's start a new folder and let's call this um, I don't know formatter. We're going to make a formatter program, and the convention that I've seen in some places is that there's this first .gi. You can see that here this 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 so maybe maybe we should just start following that uh, convention so we'll start with the first .gi and we'll do run we'll have a function called build and we can define build and let's for now just print hello world so we expect here to uh, to see something while we're compiling Okay. Uh, oh wait, I called it first. Okay. Oh, <laughs> what did I do there? Okay. Oh yeah, I think we have to import this from basic, I believe. Let me look at. Uh, what was the Minesweeper example? Yeah, import basic. I think that, that is it. Okay. So it's saying no program entry point was found. There were errors. So I guess we need to also have a main function. But we're go just going to leave it empty, I guess. 
Oops. Habits. Okay, so let's run this. Oh no, wait. Uh, we should have seen something during a compilation, right? So do we see something? I... Oh, there it is. Hello world. Okay, fantastic. So maybe we should, whenever we print something in our program here, we should make sure that it's like very obvious that something is happening there. Um, okay, so this makes it a bit clear because the linker is run after after all of this. All right. So then how does this interception stuff work? Well, let's have a look here. So compiler get current workspace. So I'm assuming that this is saying something like, well, if we're running this thing, okay, if, if we're not the primary workspace or something, then we're going to be allowed. Um, oh, there's even a comment here, minimal build loop. You probably want your own build loop if you need anything more complex than this. Um, interesting. Uh, is this a comment that was just copied over from somewhere else? I'm kind of curious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's even a thing called a project generator. Amazing. What does this do? How do I go? There we go. Generate a Visual, Visual Studio solution files out of your program. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we don't care too much about that. That's interesting though. This is just copy pasted from somewhere else. It generated from somewhere else. Okay, so that seems fine. I don't know if we really need that. Then we say build options is get build options. Where's that coming from? Is that in the same file? No, I believe that that is actually in this compiler thing. Is it not? Okay, let's have a, let's do a little search for that. Uh, oh, this is in the compiler. Right, so this, I guess gives us sort of a default set of build options. And build options, I believe, is defined uh, at the start of this file somewhere. Yeah, here. Right, so it's like what kind of executable do we want? Sort of what you would uh, traditionally see in a, a compiler flags, uh, but we don't really have flags in, uh, in Jai. So uh, we can set everything programmatically like this. Okay, so that is how you get the defaults. That sounds fine. Uh, in this case, oh, it explicitly sets it to no output, so that's why, yeah, that's uh, that's what they do. Then they set it. Oh, I guess the get build options is not even getting the default; it's just getting the current, right? Um, okay, and then we we set it to this new set of build options. Um, then they create a workspace, and then interestingly, they create. They set a different set of build options. Oh, I see, right. So when you create a new workspace, then that has its own build option. So there they're creating the executable. So here we're saying, okay, for the current workspace, which is, sort of, yeah, the workspace that we're in right now, we have no output. But then this workspace does have an executable. And then we say, okay, we're going to, uh, we will at some point build that uh, workspace. I don't know where we sort of like start. I guess the moment that we add a build file is when stuff starts happening in that workspace because I don't see any explicit sort of like workspace execute or something. Um, but we have this interception thing uh, and that's very useful because that is how we kind of like get control over the compiler. And then we can get these these messages from the compiler. Okay, well, this all seems fine. I don't think that we really need to change anything about this. But what is this file thing? Uh, okay, so we just call it with some file. And here they say, we call it with the file itself. Oh, and that is why they do this, because then we include ourselves, and then we need to bail out. Otherwise, we would go into sort of an infinite recursion here. And that is not what we want. Okay. Well, that makes a ton of sense. So I don't know, let's just copy this entire program. It seems pretty good. And let's just get rid of this set icon business because that is just the part that we don't care about for, for our uh, thing here. And I guess we don't need some of these. Okay, I guess we can keep these around. Um, or at least we need compiler and basic. That seems fine. So we're just not going to do this. 
and we're going to remove this comment. Okay, and let's just have some some print statements here and there so that we can kind of see what's going on and if if we understand this correctly. So we can say hello world from the program executable uh, main function. Okay, so this is from our main and this is uh, oh, interesting, they use like a different level of indentation. Well, I guess this that is why we will have uh, our formatter so that we can format things to our heart's desire and not really worry about what other people's conventions are. Uh, so I guess here maybe we can say print hello world from the compiler. Uh, complete. So this is when we get a complete message from the compiler. So at this point, the ex uh, executable should, yeah, like this file should basically be done. Um, great. Oh yeah, let's do this actually. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, interesting, look at this. This time we got this hello world after running the linker. So this is at the very end. I guess we can in a second look at what the different compiler message kinds are. I believe in this new, I don't know if he already introduced it, but I remember seeing in the change look like he can do something like this now. Let's see if that's right. Yeah, right, because the type, this type information is now inferred. Um, because we know the type of message kind and so we know that it's an enum like this. But let's keep it around so that we can do, do some searching for it more easily. And then our hello, hello world works as well. Okay, so I think we understand how this, uh, how this stuff is supposed to work. That is a good start. So now let's look at what are all these functions and see if they have any documentation. So they should all be in this compiler.gi uh, file. So we already looked at get uh, and set build options. This workspace thing. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff here. Around interception, I would rather have. Oh, interesting. We can't return multiple values. So he, he would rather have this return multiple values instead of just one value. Um, Sure, that doesn't matter too much for now. Oh, and it's no longer true. Okay, so just has to work on that. Okay, but otherwise, oh, you can give a workspace a name and then we get a uh, workspace back. And I guess this is a flag that says, well, this is uh, really a uh, foreign call into the compiler code. Okay, uh, set build options we looked at already. So I guess the sec second, uh, this workspace flag is optional, right? So that's optional. Uh, so let's look at this one. Why is this one and here they have minus one? I guess minus one just means current. Um, oh, interesting. Currently it's called get current workspace instead of compiler get current workspace. So we should be able to do this in a more modern version and this should still work. Oops, what did I do? I pressed up, okay. So, okay, let's look at get current workspace. Well, that's not being defined anywhere here. Uh, oh, that's in preload.gi. Okay, so we have some, some other <laughs> uh, interesting. Calling this at runtime is zero. <laughs> oh, this is funny. So you can have something that has a compiler directive when you're running it during the compiler, but that's still has a function body when you're running it at runtime. That is kind of fun. Okay, so this seems like there's a couple of different uh, special special values here. So there's like, I guess zero is what we have at, at runtime. So that means like there's basically no workspace. I guess one means like sort of like the primary workspace. Actually, we can check that real quick. Let's just stick that number in both of these places just so we can verify if we understand this correctly. Workspace. Okay. 
So actually let's put one here as well at the very top. Okay, so let's see, what do we have? So we have workspace one, workspace two. Okay, so that makes sense. So our first workspace is indeed the first run. Then this is the workspace that we create here. Um, the, well, it gets run, I guess, the moment that we run this, because then we include this file again. And then we get to two, but we will bail out. And then here we see workspace zero. Yeah, and this completion is in workspace one. Okay. I think I think I understand this then. Um, let's see if there's any documentation for compiler beginning to set because that seems pretty important. Doesn't say too much. There's like some flags that I believe we don't use. Letters flags. Oh, skip declarations without notes. Okay, sure. Um, it doesn't seem too important for us right now. Then add build file. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. So we have, yeah, the file name and the workspace. Great, and that's a compiler uh, foreign function. And then this is the interesting one, right? So here at this point, we have control of the compiler and we basically keep keeping this loop, sort of like burning our CPU. <laughs> as we wait for a message. So apparently this thing can't be blocking. There's no concept, I guess, of like intercepts or like, yeah, something or like continuations or something like that. Uh, so we just burn through, through this, but then at some point we get this complete message and then we break out of this loop and we enter intercept. So we basically say that we're done. Yeah, and that just takes the workspace. Uh, so let's look at this compiler wait for message because this is our what we're interested in, right? Like here, we should be able to get uh, the parsed abstract, uh, abstract syntax tree at some point. So this is a pointer to a compiler message. That makes sense. Um, and yeah, this is one of those fun things, right? Like you don't have to explicitly say that you're following a pointer that's sort of like implicit in the type. Makes a lot of sense as well. So let's uh, look at what this compiler message is. Okay, so there's a couple of different kinds, right? So this is the enum. The enum is uh, scoped to destruct. So that is what this syntax here does. Um, and by default, it is uh, uninitialized, I guess, if you create a new one. But then all of these uh, are the ones that you would actually get. And it has a workspace associated with it as well. And then, yeah, so this is, uh, I guess, the first time in us playing with Jai that we see uh, how, uh, what sort of uh, Jai's equivalent of like a cross, uh, a class hierarchy or some sort of, yeah, some sort of uh, hierarchical structure. So this is uh, what you can think of as the base class. Uh, and then these are sort of like the, uh, these are sort of, uh, these are the instances or uh, the derived classes where they just have to compile a message in the be sitting in the beginning and so and then this kind thing sort of like tells us which one of these it is um, and it always has a workspace so you have to then manually cast based on this kind to one of these ones I believe that the any type kind of like has this uh, type information sort of built in so that you don't have to do this manually. I don't know if this, uh, what sort of the long-term vision for this is. I haven't looked too much at the recent uh, videos. Um, but so these are the different things. So we can have a file. So I guess this is when, uh, when a file is being read, I guess. It has the file name. It has the import where it's coming from, which is null if it's in the main program. Okay. But then we also have import. Well, that sounds very similar. 
Um, yeah, and I mean, they have very similar things in there, but there's also a module name here and it says we're either opening or closing the file. So maybe this gets sort of like sandwiched around like this file and maybe an import also happens. Um, maybe we only have to read a file once, but we can do imports multiple times. That would make sense. Um, then there's errors, of course, we're not too interested in those. There's uh, when it's complete. And then compilation phase. Okay, so that sounds interesting. So compilation phase is an enum. Uh, I see. So we have this compilation phase here. And the phase itself is an enum. And what are the phases? All source code parsed. All source code that can currently be inferred is inferred. Okay. Uh, built. I see. Uh, and then we write the executable and then we're going to shell out into a linker. Okay, and then, so we have this face and we have like the executable, which we don't care too much about. We're mostly interested in this uh, parsing face because we want to get an abstract syntax tree out of it. Okay, so far so good. Uh, what else do we have here? There's some object files. Okay, so this is all stuff for the linker. We don't care too much about this. Okay, at some point it says the code is type checked. And that is also... Okay, so we only have two left. We have the code type checked and the uh, complete. So code type checked. Well, so this is interesting. This is, I think, the first time that we see the abstract syntax tree here. So I guess when the code is type checked, we get uh, we get the declarations that are in the piece of code. But it's unclear to me still, like what code is type checked? Is it the entire file? Is it part of it? Um, unclear. Okay, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff here, which looks like the actual syntax tree. Um, like if we look at this code declaration that is defined here somewhere. Code blocks, code type, code enum, lots and lots of stuff. Procedure body. Just wondering if I'm missing something. So we just went from sort of like all the, we just went from all the compiler messages that we can get to the abstract syntax tree. Just wonder if there's something else that we can do. Like maybe we don't need to actually compile all this stuff, right? Like for formatting, we don't really care too much um, about actually compiling this stuff. We just want an abstract syntax tree. We don't care if it's like the types are correct or whatever. In fact, it would be nice if we can use the abstract syntax tree if the, if the types are not correct. So here we have this thing called compiler modify procedure. Okay, so I guess once we have the code declaration, we can, uh, well, that's actually not very clear to me how this should be used. Because you would say, think that, well, which procedure are, are we modifying, right? Like you want to, maybe send a pointer to the procedure that you're modifying and then one to the, like a string or uh, a new code declaration pointer to how you're updating it. So I don't quite understand that yet. Um, let's see where this is being used. Is there any examples? Oh, oh great. The compiler has, a, has an example itself. Okay, so here they say, okay, the code type checked, right? So this is what we were just looking at. So we cast to that type, and then we iterate over the iterations, uh, the declarations. I see, and then it's like when we have a procedure body. Um, going to modify this procedure. Oh. 
Interesting. I see. So I guess we just change it in place. Right, we, we just mutate it in place and the compiler of course has its own copy of everything and so then we have to, after doing all this mutation, we have to sort of commit our change. And so we say, okay, this, this is a pointer to, uh, to a declaration that has changed. And so compiler, please update this for me. Interesting, that, uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. And so it looks like if we use this, this method with these messages, we only get, uh, get stuff once it has been uh, type checked. But I think that for our purposes, that might be a little on the late side, a little on the late side. So is there some way that we can invoke the compiler where we just want to parse it. Bunch of stuff about errors, type tables, build files, optimization levels. Just search for oops, just search for the worst the word parse in here. Yeah, we already saw that, but that didn't really help us because this also is code parsed. Um, yeah, it didn't have any metadata with it. it. Just tells us that that is the case. Okay, nothing more. Well, maybe that's okay. Um, so our LLVM options. Okay, let's just look real quick at the build options. Maybe in the build options it can say stuff like, just don't do this thing. Well, I guess we can certainly say that we don't want an executable out of it. That is for sure. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, but I don't currently see a way to just get just get it when we have parsed. Yeah, I'm probably probably missing something, or it might just not be there yet. Um, okay, fine. So let's maybe have a look at what we get if we get this type checked message. Uh, that was this one here. Okay, so we have the declaration. So what is a code declaration? So a code declaration, first of all, is a code scope entry, or at least it sort of air quotes inherits from that. So what is that? And that is it sort of inherits from code node. Okay, we're going down the rabbit hole. Well, that doesn't appear to be defined here. Maybe that's defined in preload. Oops, what did I do? Uh, not code node. Oh yeah, I think I've seen this before here. Right, there was this comment from a while ago. Okay, so this is a big thing. Okay, so this is the base node. And there's like all these kinds, so this is sort of the same structure that we saw before where you have to manually cast it based on one of these numbers. Um, there's some flags, oh yeah. And it has a file name and it has some metadata of uh, uh, where in the file this is um, this is located. So let's look at this real quick. Uh, L0, yeah, okay. Okay, so it works on a sort of line-based system. There's no, no byte offsets. Oh yeah, here. Someone suggested to instead use byte offsets. Um, yeah, I mean, we just have to, in either format, we probably have to do some, uh, some uh, conversion back and forth. 
not super clear to me that one is strictly better. Okay. Okay, so we have all this information. Well, that is pretty good. This is a pretty good start, actually. Uh, maybe we should start just printing out some of this information in a second. Okay, let's go back, though, because we were looking at code node, but before that we looked at no, uh, code scope entry. That's right. Oh, okay, that's up here. That just has a name and an import target. Okay. Uh, we'll have to see what that means exactly. Um, then the declaration itself. And so these declarations can be lots of things. I guess this thing itself is a declaration or is this a declaration? Uh, we'll have to see that. My guess is that uh, sort of like this, this whole thing is a declaration. Um, okay. There's the expressions in there. This is flattened. This is the root expression. So you have like the whole tree there. Okay, that's notes. Uh, I don't know what an alignment expression is. Okay, well, I guess we can start just uh, printing some of this information and trying to make sense of it. I mean, we could also just run uh, the, the, or like read through the print program thing, but I think it's useful to kind of internalize uh, this information, how it works. Okay. So, right, first step is to look at the correct kind. So we want to look at code type checked. So yeah, we can remove this stuff. So that is implied and we can say code type checked. And then we can cast the message to something like this. Where is it? Oh, here it is. So type check message, I don't know, something like this. Uh, we're going to cast this to the pointer of this. And we should have some information here. So we're going to look at the declarations. And I guess we're going to loop over this, so this is very similar to what we were just seeing. Then we have a code declaration. I guess we know that the code declaration will have this and it will have that. All of that gets sort of unfolded. So we will have the kind. Uh, so let's maybe print the kind. That seems useful. Um, I don't know if we can actually print the enum value. Mm. Okay, we can find out later if that's uh, something we can do. But let's just let's just do something. Uh, declaration. Actually, let's just print the whole declaration and see see what it prints out. <laughs> I don't know what this will do. If it will properly show us the fields. Okay, interesting. Oh, that just shows us a pointer. That makes sense. What if we believe this is how? We uh, you reference a pointer. Oh, and we we're never done. We we don't break out of this thing. So I guess we still need. Uh, well, wait a minute. Here we break. Is that a good idea? Maybe not. Um, let's just do what we had before. Uh, what was it complete? So I'm just kind of curious exactly what when this get, is this just for one file, for example? I don't know. Uh, unable to oh oh yeah, that's because I had to kill it. Huh. Had that issue before. Yeah, okay. So I no matter. Uh, 
That's a lot of stuff. Okay. Where did we start? Okay, this is too, <laughs> goes too far back. Um, I guess we're just inputting, uh, like we're loading too much stuff. Well, I guess this compiler stuff loads all sorts of stuff itself. Basic and string. Then basic, what does that load? Oops, I did it. Basic, oh yeah, what was it again? Module. Module is sort of like the index of HTML. Okay, yeah, so that's just a lot, of, a lot that gets imported. Uh, so we import all of that. So here at some point we have a code declaration in this file. So maybe we should just say we only care about declarations uh, in our file, but uh, how does, uh, we don't have too much metadata here. I guess we would have to look at the, okay, well, let's see if this code type checked shows up often. How do I do a search here? Oh, well, that looks old school. Uh-huh, okay. I guess this is when the basic module is type checked and we get all of that stuff. Here's another one. Oh yeah, that was the one for first. Well, there's a few. Array. But we can only really get that information from the declaration itself. Uh, is it, do we? Uh, look at this, this is kind of funky we get this array thing but then this is sort of in the middle of that oh no there might just be uh recursive stuff going on here that might be a little bit hard to see okay well this is interesting let's just print a file name shall we that like that might be interesting so we don't need to do an explicitly reference on anymore we can just do it like this let's say file name Let's see if they're kind of grouped together in a way that's uh, kind of do this maybe. Uh, how do I clear? <laughs> I don't know this stuff. Okay, whatever. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's put some. Oh, this is a little hard to see. Actually, that's some breaks there. Okay, so we do get a bit of intermingled stuff. So that's kind of curious. How does this array? Let's look at what this array file looks like. Array.gi. I don't even see any includes. Scope file. Oh. oh, wait a minute. Huh, okay. It just seems to be jumping back and forth a little bit, I guess, as different pieces of code get type checked. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Lots of, lots of declarations in the windows that you have so. okay so it jumps back and forth a little bit so i guess maybe as a set of declarations gets type checked it emits this message uh is there no way that we can get okay let's look at print program real quick for some inspiration or oh, program print i mean Program print receive message. Okay. okay. They also look at code type checked. All right, so that is encouraging. That does seem to be the, the right place to do it then. We go for the declarations, just like us. There's this thing called note created by desugaring. What on earth is that? Okay. Oh, interesting. I suspect that the compiler has sort of like a 
an early step where it does some um, transforming of syntactic sugar to sort of its, its uh, more verbose equivalent and then it will give it this flag because it was not part of the original program. That's what I think it might be. Um, and there's some flags where they say it has to be one of those things. Okay, sure. Um, oh, if it's not one of those things, if it's not a struct member and so on, yeah, sure. And then we say file declaration. Uh, okay, and then we associate it. Okay, so they have to do something like a little bit funky here as well, sort of stitching together the different code declarations. Okay, that seems that seems fine. That seems that seems good. Um, makes sense. So, what do we want to do for our thing? Okay, so we kind of want to scope our stuff to the actual file that we're interested in. So if we go back to our first OGI, we can uh, we can try to make that happen. So all of this does. We can only do any of this at compile time, right? Because in uh, in the executable, we won't have access to the to the chai compiler. So this will be uh, our formatter will be a uh, a sort of compile time program. So okay, so what do we want to do? Well, first of all, we actually never want to generate an executable. It's always no output. Um, so that is that, and we want to actually specify which file we're interested in, because we're not interested in our own file. We're interested in some in some file. Uh, so let's call it uh, format file, uh, because maybe maybe at some point, yeah, I don't know. Um, let's just call it file, and we say file. What is this going to be? Well, let's actually use our program that we were looking at yeah, uh, earlier, which is the Minesweeper. Uh, Main.chi, I think we called it. And I believe that we should be able to sort of overwrite global variables like this. Um, well, we can figure that out later exactly how that should work. Okay, so we actually really don't care about this. Um, well, let's see if this works. Let's see if this works. Oh. Oops, did I accidentally edit? I keep doing that, I'm not used to my keyboard. We're programming on Windows for that matter. Ugh. There's a typo here somewhere. How did, how did that happen? I thought that earlier it was working. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Do we have the name of the actual thing in there? A lot of stuff. Well, I guess what we can do Mm. Well, the first thing that we need to know is like this is um, this is a relative path, and all of these are absolute paths. So I wonder if there's some way we can uh, get this absolute path so that we can filter out the ones that we don't care about. So let's see, do we have a module for that? File utilities. Well, that sounds like a, good, a promising start. File utilities test, file list, visit files. File exists. Bunch of stuff that does things with paths. Um, let's actually maybe look at one of these. Mm, no. File contains any. Okay. Mm. 
something went fast. Let's search for absolute. That usually shows up in the is absolute fast. Okay, well that's interesting. Uh, absolute time. Okay, we don't care about that. Let's maybe search for absolute path. No, this underscore path. Oh, we just have this. Oh, <laughs> no, that's kind of funny. It just tries to find. Mm. Gosh, how do we get path extra? Okay, well, seems to be some translate path. Strip extension. Just a file name. Well, this seems to be. We might be on the right path there. <laughs> no pun intended. Okay. Path file name. Power. Oh, uh, look at oh, this is I see. Oh, there's some examples here. Oh, this is great. So this is not what we want. Path strip file name. Yeah. Yeah, right. These are all leaking. Interesting. It's like hard coded in there. Hmm. Well, none of this is <laughs> it's quite what we need. Uh, pa -pa -pa -pa. Okay, let's go to our file file utility.py. Ah, uh, this is also interesting. It really seem to be. Yeah. We have some tests here. Set. This should not be so difficult, right? How do I get an absolute file <laughs> for a file? My god. Uh, yeah, these are just string operations. So they. Uh, maybe there's something about the current directory's name or something, but even then you would need some way to actually resolve a relative path. Mm. Guess this access thing. Yeah, no, that's not quite what we want. Yeah. Well, let's look at this stuff here. Visit files, recursive. Surely they must, must be doing something. Uh, so they have a directory name. 
Okay, and they start with the first directory. And they get like some wide string. Yeah, this is not that useful, is it? Find first file. Right, so this is a Windows API. File visit info, file list. What if we do a file list? Okay. The hell with it. Let's just try something. <laughs> File, which is in our case a path like that, and then this is yeah, just in the modules directory, so we should be able to just import it. It's zoom. File list, nothing. Nothing. Oh, why that? Oh, well, still nothing. <gasps> oh dear. Well, if we just give it this part, then surely it should do something, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, there's three files in there. Let's just print out the first one of them. See if this is useful at all. No, it's still a relative path. Come on. Come on. Okay. Well, we can just do this the hacky way, I guess. Where we just strip off. Uh, I don't like it. But I don't, I don't see a much better way right now. Their name, how did they get the, oh, I see. Yeah. Mm. None of it, it, this is very nice. Well, I'm sure it's just a small function that should be easy to implement in this utilities function um, at some point. Um, it's just that, I don't know the the Windows uh, APIs at all. Let's have a quick look. File. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff, and a bunch of stuff is also just not implemented. This, yeah, I mean, there's a three hundred something. Uh, Get full path name. Look at that. This one's deprecated. I guess this is a wide. I see, I see. Well, okay. Okay, well, let's see. This is kind of fun. We can see if we can implement um, a utility function here that abstracts over the different file systems. So here, I guess we're in the if windows. So we can say something. Uh, well, it's a. Uh, File exists. Uh, file this, copy file. What's the convent name and convention here? Let's just say get full file name. Get full path. And we 
we're going to say path. Oh, this looks like it's path uh, is a string. Like this. We're going to return a string as well. And we have to call this thing, but we have to deal with this uh, UTF2 to wide. And then let's see, buffer length, part. Hmm. How, let's see, <laughs> let's look at an example. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff. Well, most of these are uh, optional. In this case, though, you don't look really optional. Let's, I guess, just have a look here. Some examples. Name of the file. Okay. Oh. It's the length. Oh, okay, I see. Okay. So we just need to point this at the there there. Um Okay, so we also need to know how to copy those buffers back. Uh Okay, so this is the one that we're interested in. This one we don't care about. Okay, so we have to... Oh, man. <laughs> this stuff is... <laughs> it's, it's, nice, it's nice that there's people who abstract over nonsense like this. Um, let's just see, is there like other places where we... Yeah. I don't know if I want to deal with this. Well, okay, sure, let's do it. I mean, we can, we can do something like this. It's like buffer size, this is a constant. Um, well, how long can things be? I don't know. Uh, That's NTFS. Okay. Sure. Sure. X path that we have that defined here somewhere. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, look at this. They do it the same way. Get path of running executable. Oh, that's fun. Okay. So, okay. This is a very similar way of doing things. Yeah. Great. Um, well, now I'm, cu now I'm curious if that's already. <laughs> Whoa, that seems low. Yeah, no shit. That definitely seems low. Uh, gets path. Oh, fun. Okay, so there's a couple of places where we use this, but we just never use it to get the absolute path. Okay, well, let's implement it. I guess we can contribute it back if it works. So, yeah, this was exactly what I was going to do. Um, except, yeah, well, it's not doing it right. So we have a buffer. Um, oh, yeah, this is how it works. Buff.data. And then Windows does what next path. In our case, I think it's swapped. It's the other way around, right? Like, first we get the buffer length and then the buffer itself. This is a UA to... Uh, okay. So I don't know what the deal is with that. So we get this in... UTF-8, that would be surprising. Doesn't say. Null terminated string. Okay, well, good enough for me. So yeah, let's pass in 
Yes, and then buffer the data. Um, and we don't really care about what we get out of it. Or do we? Maybe we do. Because we need to at some point do something with the buffer. Well, let's see how they convert it back into a string. So here's the buffer. Yeah, I guess they look at the success. Yeah, don't actually use it then. They do some sort of translation step. So here they have to convert it back. They're assuming that it's a white thing. Well, yeah, you would assume that because this has the W in there. Uh, so if we look here. Well, <laughs> okay, here the result is a U16. Wait, this is all very confusing. Is this truly? Well, yeah, this doesn't make sense. LPCW. Okay, yeah. And then this one is not well. It does it has it has the W in there as well. Okay, so this is still well. Then what is the difference between this and this? Oh, uh, const, const and non-const. Okay, so I think this should be a sixteen-bit. Thing then I think this might be a, a mistake um, yeah yeah look at this it's always with the W it's yeah that's that sounds like this might be just uh, well now I'm confused oh wait sorry this is the wrong one we were looking at get full path name yeah I think this this should be uh, like this. I mean, this one is as well. I suspect that this. Yeah, I'm not sure. I hope we can just pass a null pointer here and have it just not use it. Okay. Yeah, I think it should be like this. But I might be mistaken. Let's look at. Let's say <laughs> we should probably keep a file of patches. I mean, I could track this in Git or something, but whatever. This there's a lot to do. Okay, so let's say that that is a. U16, then this should be okay. And hopefully here we can just pass a null pointer. And then yeah, let's look again at how they uh, pluck thing, things out of it. Yeah, so then they convert it back like this. They do this whole convert slashes business, which uh, I don't know if we need to do that right here, right now. I don't, this is in Windows. Yeah, it kind of converts backslashes to forward slashes. Oh, interesting. I guess there's uh, maybe some compatibility where we just only deal with forward slashes here. Um, oh, interesting. Like, let's look at this. What kind of. Yeah, <laughs> it uses forward slashes here. Oh, amazing. Okay, great. So we will need the same function. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's just do this. <laughs> Let's just copy paste the whole thing. I mean, we should extract out that uh, convert slashes thing at some point, I guess. But let's just first get something working. So I guess we can assign this here. We can have this return like that. Uh, I guess we've been using. This convention in this file. Fine. This translate path. Yeah, is there already? We were looking at these string functions. Uh, yeah, look at this translate path.
Oh. Haha. <laughs> great in place. Yeah, it does modify it in place. Which is not so great. But what are you gonna do? I mean I think they should be like this then, but uh, sure. Okay, so I guess we can just use that. Um, let's really make sure. Let's have another look. Yeah, it's really just. Oh, wait, what? Okay. Huh. Okay, so here we are keeping this. Okay, but I guess we can overwrite that. That's kind of funny though. Like, let's let's make up our minds how we're going to represent file names. Um, doesn't have to be one way or the other. Uh, I guess if in the compiler we get things of this format, then we should be using this format. Fine, 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 fine. So I guess we do this. We say full path. And then we do, yeah, so here they also don't return the string anymore. It just does it in place. So translate path should be returning for it, I think. That should be, that's better. But this will do. So now we've allocated this buffer. Um, yes, that's just allocated that, yeah, there was no malloc here that will be freed. That's just on the stack. Um, Okie dokes, that looks good. Now let's see if we can use it. And maybe we can contribute it back. Maybe we should look at the post 6 version of it as well. Uh, I don't know what am I doing here. Where were we first? Okay. So I guess instead of calling file list, we're going to call get full path. There was a file utilities. We already import that. Great. Um, we're going to do Windows. It's not set here. Oh dear. We're importing Windows, aren't we? Maybe that is not getting exported. No, it should be. This is outside of. Hmm. Scope file. Should be scoped. Wait, what were we searching for? No, no, I'm sure that's not what I meant. Next path. Yeah. It uses Windows dot. Here it doesn't. Where's it getting this Windows from here? Oh, ha! <laughs> can do it like that. That's kind of fun. Okay, so I guess we just don't need to qualify it like this because we just imported wholesale. Great. Uh, mistakes. Great. That is a fun thing to do though. Okay, let's see. Given, mm hmm Yeah, so let's just try, let's just try it. Let's just cast it. Uh, <laughs> file list 67. Well, that is not quite what I expected. Uh, oh, let's let's say get full path here. Ah, look at that! I still had back as backslashes, so I guess we're not doing our job quite well with a with a trend. Okay, but this is this is encouraging. That's pretty good. That's a good start. Okay, but we are. 
apparently not doing this translate path thing correctly. So let's see, where is that defined again? String. Oh, right. We have to explicitly set the separator to forward slash because that was that discrepancy earlier that we talked about. Uh, is that to u8? So it should be like this, I guess. Yeah, is that how it works? I guess let's look at her. Oh, char. <laughs> oh, fun, 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 fun. <laughs> this language has has some has some funny funny quirks. It's, yeah, I mean it's not unreasonable. Okay, now we have forward slashes. Not bad, not bad. Um, right, so in windows.gi we had this. And then in uh, file utilities we have this. Whoops, what did I do? Okay, let's briefly look at how the POSIX version of this would work. We would have something similar here. What would it look like? I mean, we're really get, getting into a rabbit hole here. Full path, no, that's not a thing. Full path, no, okay. POSIX. Full path. Real path. Hard links. Right, okay. Uh, okay. Real. Welcome to the real path. Okay, so that's not being defined here. Canonicalized absolute path name. Yeah, okay. Real path, real path, real path. Okay, that's too fancy. I guess it's just not defined in the POSIX definition that we have here. We have stat. Let's just search the page real fast. Oh, okay, there's a different definition here in libc bindings. Well, this looks simpler because it gives us back a u and eight array. We pass in a u and eight array, so we don't have any to do any conversion to white strings. Uh, I don't know what we pass into the sim link, but it looks like, yeah, okay, just null. Um, oh, we can actually just use null. Okay, so that is a little bit better, I guess, for us here as well. If we just say null here. Okay, so then get full path here is quite a bit simpler, where we just call real path. Uh, it's left the data. Okay, yeah, so we do have to null terminate it just to be sure, because that is not a given. Path of, ah, uh, I see, this is, yeah, this is the POSIX equivalent of the other thing we were looking at. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, so we do have to create a buffer. Um, well, okay. Well, I guess we don't have to. So in Jai, paths that are like files, strings are not terminated by default, but it doesn't have to be. It's not guaranteed that when you get past a string, that it will be null terminated. It's just that by default, the com constant strings are. So it might not be wise to rely on that. So I guess 
it's still good to have like um, to basically create a path, a new path string that we set to. Uh, yeah, we would have to allocate it, don't we? Uh, I'm sure that there's a helper for this though. That this must be very common. Simple string to string. A couple of two strings. Inline length. To C string. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so that's what we want. So we will have to take care to free it. So Can do something like this. So that should be. F uh, no, wait. Am I doing this in the wrong place? No. Oh no! Wait, I'm doing it in the right place. Never mind. Okay. Um, okay. So now we have a C string, and now we should be able to just call our wasn't in POSIX, where is it? libc bindings, there we go. We can just call this uh, real path. Yeah, and just return it immediately. That seems right. I don't know if it will understand this return as sort of a cast to a string. Um, it might not. Let's see what the compiler has to say. Well, it might not even get here. Mm. Let's just try it out real quick in here. <laughs> if we just for shits and giggles say, okay, we get the C string. Oh, but the C string is still. Okay, now this is a U and eight pointer. Now we say return. Will that be okay? No. Only literals do. I guess that's reasonable. So we have to explicitly to string. Okay, I guess we have this. So it finds the string length and then converts it. So if we do this, then it should be okay. Yes. Okay, so that just returns it now. So we have to do two string there. But we have to free the original now. Uh, no, because it just sets the pointer there. Okay. Good. Okay, so whoever calls this has the responsibility of freeing it. Which we didn't do. We, we were leaking here. Uh, in our, where is it? For a matter, we're leaking this. It's quite easy to do. You saw a comment about that before. But then again, there's this concept of the temporary buffer. So you can kind of leak to your heart's content if you use that. I don't know how that works here. Um, I mean, this stuff gets put on the heap, I guess. Um, so that's actually still leaking. All right, I guess we have to be careful. Okay, okay, so this is working now, right? Yeah, this is still working. Now let's uh, put this this thing in our in our file of patches. Okay, well, this is considerably easier than Linux. Well, if 
we've hardly made any progress. <laughs> but we made some. Because okay, that's at least to the next step and then I'm and I'm tired. Uh, so the next step is to com actually compare this path. So this is uh, this is like um, a full path is this, except we can just plug in the file here. I guess we have to free this at some point. Uh, we don't really need this anymore. We understand this. So now, now what we can say here is, well, we only care about this particular file name, right? So it's like if echo.filename file name is not the full path, then uh, continue. So now we should only be seeing the declarations that we care about, and we do. There's a bunch of other stuff where we get a code type check message. We just don't care about them. That is great. That is great. So I guess one thing that we can do now is we can say, well, let's just co collect all of these uh, declarations, right? So we have, um, what is the type of this again? Let's close out some stuff. Ah, I use a slow sublime. I use sublime because it's fast. It's the purpose. Okay, so, oh yeah, this is, well, I guess we want the same thing. We want the dynamically sized ar array. Um, so this is a this, and then we want to do what we learned last time you can use uh, array add uh, yeah and I always I always forget do we do the dot dot or do we don't do the dot dot I think we do the dot dot yeah because this is sort of like the un the variant where we don't care if it's dynamic or not, and this is explicitly where it is. So I guess what we do then is when we get declaration that we do care about, uh, we get a little bit less indirection. We can do it like this. This I always forget. Data count. Okay. Ooh, 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 we have to send a pointer to this thing. That makes sense. Okay. We found forty one declarations. I guess we don't need these anymore because we know that this works at this point. So this is how we collect the declarations. All right. I think that is a good point to stop for today. Let's clean this up a little bit. Because I guess this is really the part where we get our declarations. Well, I suspect that we will need to full pass later when we actually start doing some, some accessing of the, the path. Oh, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, but this, uh, yeah, this works. Sweet. All right. That is it for today.